Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. Um, let me say a couple of things uh, before delving into the talk. Uh, first, parts of this talk are going to be somewhat geeky. Uh, that's sort of on purpose. <laughs> In part, <laughs> it may reflect the fact that I don't know how to give any other kind of talk, but. Um, I also want to um, mention that there are several other people whose work gets touched upon during this talk. The primary ones are uh, two, Pinar and Megana, listed there, but several others as well. Okay, so um, first of all, let me just lay the groundwork of where I'm coming from. At Carnegie Mellon University, uh, computing is an entire college. It's called the School of Computer Science and it contains things like the machine learning department, the primary uh, or the original computer science department that I'm calling systems and theory, the language technologies institute, human interaction institute, robotics, and so forth. And when we talk about cognitive computing, uh, or AI++, as it has been uh, discussed uh, this morning and, and uh, yesterday, um, it's essentially in the middle front and center in all of these activities. And as you can see, it covers all of them, and more than any other one, I think it covers machine learning. So uh, my presentation is gonna be on machine learning, not on language technologies, even though I do both. Actually, these days, I've been focusing much more on core, um, uh, core machine learning. Uh, my uh, esteemed colleague, Tom Mitchell, who is nominally machine learning, has been focusing more on natural language. Good thing about a university is you can do those sorts of things. Um, okay, so let me review some trends in machine learning. Uh, we've seen a lot of discussion about deep, uh, deep learning and uh, deep neural networks. Essentially, that refers to the number of layers, and they have been particularly uh, successful in vision, speech, and other kinds of uh, processing, including starting to be successful in NLP itself. Uh, there's other kinds of machine learning as well. Uh, let's not forget them all. Uh, reinforcement learning, especially in robotics, has been around uh, for classification tasks, large margin methods such as support vector machines. Um, when you have a lot of domain knowledge and strong priors, you can use graphical models in which you uh, encode the conditional dependencies, and there, so therefore everything else is conditionally independent, uh, as, uh, and, and also you can uh, add strong priors and so forth. Now, somewhat orthogonal, not totally orthogonal, but somewhat orthogonal to the, the baseline machine learning methods, and these four are examples, is how do we deal with sparsity, not so much of data, but of answers or, or of label data. In other words, when we have raw data, but we don't necessarily know what we're supposed to do with it, or uh, does this data correspond to a particular diagnosis or a particular treatment that should be recommended or a particular uh, label as to what an image is and so forth? When those, that knowledge or those answers or those labels are very sparse, what do we do? And this is a problem for all of the methods. Some have different ways of dealing with them uh, than others, but it sort of cuts across. And so what I'm gonna be focusing on is the two uh, that are in blue here, uh, active and proactive uh, machine learning how do you get the external help that counts the most? And also transfer learning, uh, also known as multitask learning, that was already mentioned before uh, by Joshua and possibly others um, here as well. There are other methods as well, transductive methods and, and um, proactive teaching that I'm not going to uh, delve into because of, of time limitations. Okay, so um, this slide represents all of um, Supervised machine learning, uh, it shouldn't say just active learning, it should say all of supervised machine learning in a nutshell, in one slide. Okay, this is what we normally take two or three semesters to teach. <laughs> uh, but this is just to get the main principle across. Um, and um, at, at the apo apologies to everybody that I'm oversimplifying their work by trying to cast it into a single, uh, a single slide. Uh, normally we have training data. Training data consists of inputs and outputs. X's are the inputs, Y's are the outputs. Uh, symptoms uh, and the corresponding diseases, or diseases and the corresponding treatments, uh, or raw images and the labels, about linguistic labels about what are going on. Or the Y's can also be structured. Uh, it could be a response, a sequential response, as we saw again in uh, Joshua's 
talk. I'm going to actually keep referring to your talk as much as I can because shortcut some of the things that I would otherwise have to say. Um, so in many cases, you have both of those. That's called labeled data. And in many other cases, you have a lot of unlabeled data, only the access, only the inputs, and not this, the desired outputs, or not enough of them. We also have a functional space. The functional space is what kind of functions or, or machine learning methods uh, we're allowed to apply or to test out in this data. Deep neural networks are an example of part of that functional space. Large margin methods are another example. Logistic regression is a particularly simple example, and so forth. And we have a fitness criterion. This is the key to machine learning. We're trying to minimize something that's called a loss function. And a loss function looks messy, but it really is, the idea is very simple. One component is the empirical loss or the empirical error. You're trying to minimize the difference between the prediction and the actuals on the data that you have an answer for. And that difference could be the least squares norm, could be just the difference itself, the L1 norm. Uh, it could be the number of cases that you're wrong, the L0 norm. It could be the Chevy-Chef norm, the biggest difference is the only thing that really matters, and so forth. That's the left hand of that e side of that equation. The right hand side is the model complexity. You want the simplest model that has the smallest empirical error. This is Occam's razor. I can predict the, the data that I've seen by replicating all of it. That will not generalize. Uh, but that's going to be a very complex function that says a big, huge tabular function, for example, uh, as opposed to a linear relation, if that were happened to work, or, or something else that is uh, much less complicated. So in general, you're trying to minimize the, the uh, prediction loss and minimize the complexity and with some uh, coefficient that balances between the two. And for active learning, we also have a sampling strategy which says, of the data that we don't know the answers, which one will be most useful? in order to further reduce the loss going forward. So if I can have uh, some uh, phys expert opinion from physicians as to what this patient really is suffering from with a perplexing set of symptoms, and I trust that source, um, that would be an example of asking that question, getting that answer, and retraining the model, one at a time or small batch at a time. Okay, now active learning is important uh, for, again, many of the reasons that were cited earlier, uh, that there's a lot more unlabeled data, data that we don't know what it really means and data that's otherwise. Uh, I worked a lot in, in proteomics, so I'm gonna be using examples of proteomics uh, here. Apologies to the majority of you who are not biologists, but you're gonna get a, a very quick proteomics lesson uh, this time too. Uh, the majority of proteins don't have known structure. Uh, in terms of astronomy, uh, the majority of galaxies in the Sloan Sky Survey, uh, you don't know what kind of galaxy they are. Uh, the majority of web pages don't have topic labels. Uh, the majority of financial transactions, you don't know whether they're legitimate or fraudulent. Almost all of them are legitimate, but you, don't, you only know of a few of the uh, potential fraudulent parts. So with these cases, what do you do? And this is where active sampling uh, is important. And there are many different sampling strategies. Instead of reading this, this laundry list, let me just illustrate a, a couple of them um, very simply. Uh, this is a large margin classifier, meaning that we have two classes so far, the red and the black, and that the margin in the, in, in the middle, um, the uh, solid line is the one that is the decision boundary. This is really simple, it's linear, and it's in, and it's in two dimensions. Normally, it would, it would have a kernel, and so it would be anything but linear, and it would be in a thousand dimensions. But I don't know how to draw thousand dimensional um, PowerPoint, so <laughs> two dimensions will have to do. So uh, now, if you want to improve, do you have the right decision boundary or not? Which of the gray uh, points would you select? Which would be most informative? Anybody have a? The center ones, okay, so there's two center ones. There's the one that's right next to the line or there's the one that is in that cluster there. You could pick the one that's right next to the center line or the one that's in the cluster. That one gives you information about all the others in the cluster. So that's called density-based sampling. You could pick the one that's right on the center line. This is called uncertainty-based sampling. You could pick uh, combinations of these methods and so forth. And, and uh, that's a lot of what the, the uh, active learning literature does. Uh, they also try to measure the disagreement between different classifiers. They have a neural network, and they have a large margin classifier, and they disagree uh, on the label of an unknown 
that's a good one to ask. Uh, whereas if they're all in agreement, if you have multiple classifiers and they all would say the same thing, very little new information would be gathered by asking. Um, so let me not dwell upon the, uh, the points here. Uh, but one of the phenomena that we measure is that there is no such thing as an optimal sampling strategy. Uh, this graph represents uh, error re reduction as a function of the number of samples that we retrain the system with. And we see that the density-based sampling works well at the beginning and then uh, flattens out, whereas the uncertainty-based sampling uh, works less well at the beginning and then eventually picks up. Well, the uncertainty-based sample requires you to know where the decision boundary is in order to know whether something is uncertain. And if you don't have any idea where the decision boundary is at the very beginning, um, it's not going to work very well. Uh, the density-based sampling, you sample the big clusters. But what do you do after you sample the big clusters? You sample the little clusters, so they give you less information. So, so at different parts of the operating range, um, they work differently. And we developed a method uh, called dual that can uh, switch strategies dynamically and that outperforms uh, the best of the single strategies. Okay, I'm not gonna, again, dwell on the details of that. But let's go beyond um, active learning. Active learning assumes there's an oracle that gives you a right answer. It assumes that this oracle is perfect it assumes that the oracle is indefatigable, never gets tired. You can ask as many questions as you want until you run out of uh, time or budget. Um, it assumes that there's only one oracle. In real life, that's not the case. There isn't one expert. There's a whole community of experts, a whole community of physicians that know different things about different cancers or different aspects of treating oncology. Some of them are less available than others. Some are more accurate. Some have specializations and others. How do you deal with a crowd of experts as teachers? That's part of what uh, proactive learning is all about. Not just what to ask, but whom to ask it of. Uh, it also takes into account uh, uh, things like the cost uh, of labeling. The cost can be an opportunity cost or a, or a financial cost. Um, so we worked in uh, going into all of these generalizations of active learning. Um, we called it proactive learning, mostly because we couldn't think of something else. <laughs> Um, you have to decide whom to go and ask for it. And it's now uh, actually being used quite a bit in practice. It's one of these kinds of things that it's hard to prove theorems about, although we proved a few of them that are not very meaningful, uh, but it really works in practice. So essentially, proactive learning is that you can have multiple sources of information, experts or oracles. Uh, you can have, they can have varying reliability. So you have to estimate the reliability, and you also have to estimate who knows what. So you're learning about your information sources as well as learning about the task at hand. So it's dual optimization. And you have to jointly optimize both. One is a long-term optimization because you'll have many learning tasks and it will be the same information sources that may be available for them. And the other one is learning about the actual task at hand. Okay, I am going to skip over some of the details of how that works. Um, I will say that there's one more aspect to proactive learning um, which is, what if the oracles evolve? They change over time. You're experts. So we have a graduate student who could answer some of the questions, but now he's got, got his PhD, he finished his postdoc, he's now working in, uh, at IBM Yorktown and Watson, and now he has a lot more expertise in, in machine learning or whatever area. Okay, you wanna be able to track that change. Or you may have somebody else you know, whose hair is graying and who gets out of practice and hasn't actually worked on anything except management um, for a long time. And so this person's expertise might decline. I, I won't name any names. Uh, I'll just look in the mirror. <laughs> um, or you can get somebody that's temporarily declined because they're exhausted. They've been work overworked and, and then they recover again after some time. So how do we tr track changes in expertise? And we use this, there's many techniques. The one that we found that works the best is a um, Bayesian particle filtering uh, in which we uh, assume that the expertise is cons or close to constant at the beginning and then there's a derivative that it gradually starts to shift uh, of them. And then we do this by comparing, uh, when we ask multiple oracles, comparing the consensus opinion and how some of them diverge from the consensus opinion. And the result is that the uh, blue line tracks are red. In other words, it works much better than uh, some of the other techniques like running averages and so forth. 
and it also helps with actual predictor accuracy. This one, sorry, this one here was just predicting how well a particular uh, expert will answer the question, and this is using that information to actually solve the learning problem. And the black line at the top is sort of the optimal performance you could get if you had all the information. So normally you can approach it asymptotically. Um, usually you don't quite hit it. Um, now we've applied proactive learning to a number of tasks, um, including lately malware detection. This is interesting. This is not malware that you can catch using semantic. This is new malware. Um, so you have some new malware, and is this likely to be malware or not from its behavior or from its static code? And so we have classifiers for that, and the, the, uh, these versions that are trained with, not with that particular malware, but with related malware before, tend to converge faster. We've also applied um, active or proactive learning to machine translation. Uh, now, in this case, it doesn't matter what the translation model is. Okay, it could be standard statistical MT, uh, it could be uh, Bengio's brand new uh, super duper uh, um, deep network type of uh, MT with the parts that we saw before. Uh, what matters here is what information do you use to train uh, to provide translations, to provide the label data so as to uh, try to optimize it. And the way that we were lo looking at was assuming now you have a crowd of translators versus you have a single expert translators. The crowd is Amazon Mechanical Turk. In other words, uninformed people trying to translate. It turns out that there's no data like more data. And if we look at the results here, let me skip the, the graphical version and just look at the two uh, uh, highlighted in red. Um, if we ask three or four people who are not professional translators to provide translation, you get higher improvement in the training one. You get noisy data, but you get more of it than if you ask a single expert translator. Um, now, the interesting thing here is after this slide, we did some other experiments, and the uninformed uh, but large amounts of data is great until the system gets good. Okay, then it starts to saturate. Now you go to the expert translator, and you get another bump. So it's a little bit like the dual story that I gave you before. A different operating ranges, uh, different um, methods work best. Okay, so let me wrap up the part on proactive learning. Uh, this is how do you get information from multiple sources, multiple experts. They may have different expertise, different reliabilities, different availabilities, and you have to learn those properties. You have to estimate the parameters of your information sources as well as solve the task at hand. Okay, so let me mention now one other um, application because this relates to the next task I want to do. Uh, we worked in protein-protein interactions in computational virology. Um, this uh, uh, big mess here is uh, how the proteins interact inside one organism, and this is less than 1% of the protein interactions. So if this looks messy, the real one is messier. Um, the ones at the bottom are the ones that don't seem to interact with anything. Obviously, they have to interact, otherwise the proteins wouldn't exist, they wouldn't do anything. Uh, so this sort of reflects the state of our knowledge rather than the state of biology, the, of the real bi biology. Um, we're interested in trying to figure out how the proteins of a host, like a human, interact with the proteins of a pathogen, like a bacterium or a virus. Because if we understand that interaction, we can interdict it. We can design new antiviral or antibacterial drugs better. Um, and so right now we're working at the understanding level, not necessarily at the drug design level, although of course there's uh, significant uh, interest in the pharmaceutical uh, world to do part two. So proteins can interact directly through physical contact, indirectly by being members of the same protein complex, that is they all kind of glue together, or indirectly via pathways. Information that gets transmitted uh, uh, through the cell wall and so forth. Um, and uh, with ligands and so forth that, that uh, interact. And there are a number of different features, never mind what they are. Um, and so for this test, uh, in order to form a good predictor for which proteins would interact with which other ones, um, we had to estimate the, um, the reliability of the different sources of information. Some can be reports in the literature, some can be different experiments. You can have high throughput experiments with microarrays and you get a lot of data, but it's relatively unreliable. You can have point information like crystallography that you know for sure some interaction has taken place. Um, 
but provides a lot less data and is more costly. And so applying these proactive learning methods, you're able to come up with uh, refined intera interactomes. Okay, since time is running short, um, I'm going to stop talking about proactive learning and move to topic number two. There are only two. <laughs> Um, and uh, that is uh, transfer learning. Transfer learning is another way of coping with insufficient data. But this time, instead of trying to get the data from the experts, you're trying to get the data from what you re problems you solved before. You're trying to transfer information from having solved a similar machine learning problem, um, and now you have to solve the new one. Or you may have solved a whole bunch of them, and you're trying to transfer from all of them. The first one is typically called, one-on-one -on -one is called transfer learning. The second one is typically called multitask learning. It's basically the same thing, the same underlying principles. Okay, and so this is something that has dear to my heart because I worked on uh, methods of uh, reasoning and learning by analogy in the 1980s, then case-based reasoning came out, and now it gets rediscovered every once in a while. Uh, now the new field of transfer learning has realized that this is a good idea, irrespective of the history. Um, so it keeps getting reinvented in different guises. But I think now we have much better machinery to deal with it than we, than we did before in terms of trying to understand how the uh, machine learning methods work. And so let me tell you about one particular case, the protein-protein interaction between hosts and, uh, in this case, bacteria. This is um, uh, you know, three different typhus bacteria, uh, plague bacteria and anthrax, and uh, on the host side we have people, mice, and, and that kind of plant. Um, and you want to be able to transfer information across them. Suppose you, you know one or two of these links about how those interactions take place, can we fill out the rest? And we can, and it turns out that this is one source where knowledge is important. Uh, we know the, the physiological or the, uh, um, the distance between these in the evolutionary tree, and that gives us a good initial priors to our system. I mean, so strong priors mean you need less data to get to the same point. So knowledge as priors turns out to be useful. Knowledge as priors, not knowledge as constraints. You can always override them with data. Um, and um, on this test that we did, um, it was interesting because we have a lot less information about some of them, like typhus, and a lot more information about the other ones, and we're still trying to transfer the knowledge about which proteins interact. Um, proteins, the, the pathogens, will attack similar pathways. Um, pathways like the, the um, uh, well, the reproductive um, uh, pathway, the, the uh, um, RNA decoding pathway, uh, and so forth. And so you find out what some of those common pathways are likely to be based on the uh, hypothesis. This is the metabolic pathway for uh, glucose transpose, transport, how do you take the glucose from one part to where it's needed to generate energy in the ATP, ADP cycle. And our multitask objective is you want to try to minimize empirical error. And remember what I showed you earlier. All of you memorized that formula, right? <laughs> okay, we use another variant of it. The left term is, a, is a L stands for loss function. This is the difference between the real and the predicted. The part at the end um, with a WT squared is the model complexity that you're trying to minimize. And now you have this thing in the middle painted in some kind of purplish um, color that's supposed to, supposed to be gray but isn't. Um, and different machines have different ideas of what color should be. Um, this is you're trying to come up with the, uh, um, a kind of regularizer for differences. So if the um, physiology of the different organisms is very similar, um, then this one has a, a greater weight. You get penalized for predicting things that are different from what you knew already in the case you had much more training data in the past. Um, and uh, using these things, we're using logistic loss in this particular example. Um, at the bottom, uh, we can come up with ways that uh, work a lot better. These are details on how we solve all these things. You have to deal with non-convex functions but they turn out to be a DC class difference of convex functions, so they're, they're good approximators to it. Let me skip that part. And now you also have to um, learn the hyperparameters, how much model complexity is important, how much the difference between the, um, uh, the two organisms is important, and, and we use the knowledge to estimate those parameters. In other words, you can uh, estimate them empirically, but it turns out that the knowledge estimator is actually more accurate because you don't have enough data. 
if you had enough data that could probably overwhelm. We also, uh, here's one other lesson I want to bring in. This is kind of a, an aside, but we thought that we would get really fancy and match the similarity between the organisms using kernel mean matching, which is this cool technique that Alex Mola and others have invented and other people have used. And uh, you generate similarity kernels based on physiological differences and based on evolutionary differences, put them all together, train the models, train the models with not too much data, and bingo, what happens? It fails. <laughs> it fails because you don't have enough training data to go with these complex um, methods that are in principle better, but in practice worse. Uh, so these are the kinds of results that you get. Uh, precision recall curves, top to the right is the optimal point. Perfect precision, perfect recall. In reality, there's a trade-off between them. And uh, the blue one is the one that sort of works best all around and the uh, uh, kernel mean method is the black one here, the fancy one, and it's not at the top. And when you have real little data, it's awful. And uh, when you have uh, more data, like at the top, it's somewhat better. We, didn't, we couldn't make it win because we never had a data set that was rich enough in terms of labeled data. Uh, we'd still like to do that. Then we could publish a paper on this nice, fancy, beautiful math that doesn't work. <laughs> Okay, so um, let me give you some parting thoughts um, they, in, in terms of multitask learning is that it really does work. Not all the methods work. You saw an example of one that didn't. Um, the more straightforward ones seem to work better. And now we're applying it to uh, re recommendation systems, referral nets. You have to solve a problem with many experts and an expert doesn't know the answer, but he might know who knows the answer. So we're actually learning to refer uh, which is an interesting task. There, the nodes in the referral network can be human experts, uh, could be Watson modules, uh, could be crowdsource, could be anything you want. Um, in terms of proactive learning, remember that's what I presented earlier, it also works uh, for machine translation, malware detection, proteomics, and so forth. Um, but one of the weird things is that it has succeeded in practice. It has been sort of embraced by people who are using it but somehow in the machine learning literature, transfer learning is, is big. People embrace it. And the old form of active learning is there, but now they think, well, active learning is passe, was what they did 10 years ago. Now we have a new version of active learning that works better, but somehow the field doesn't fully embraced it yet. Um, one of those weird things that happen. Um, but the key point is at the bottom, is that you have to cope with label sparsity. When you don't know, you don't have answers for your data, or you have very sparse answers, or you have only answers for one corner of your data set and not for the majority of it, you still have to cope with data sparsity regardless of the underlying machine learning method, regardless of whether you're using uh, old uh, simple methods or big new ultra deep uh, neural nets, you still have that problem. And so you have to uh, uh, work with methods such as the following in conjunction with those learning methods. These don't substitute, these augment. Okay, so um, I think I finished slightly early. Um, thank you. Thank you.